we are going to talk about uh, some of the common symptoms um, that uh, we are going to see not only in palliative care but also in any in any patients uh, so in the gastrointestinal symptoms mainly we are going to deal with uh, nausea and vomiting constipation <laughs> intestinal obstruction uh, yeah uh, so um, nausea and vomiting is one of the most common symptoms that occurs uh, in many patients uh, and in our days there is a tendency to write only one medication for treating nausea and vomiting that is on time certain and uh, there are uh, some side effects for on time certain also knowingly or unknowingly uh, many uh, prescriptions are continuing with on time certain for many days and it causes constipation uh, so uh, let's uh, hear from dr sri devi about uh, what we need to be careful about treating nausea and vomiting and uh, dr sri devi is a palliative care physician working with palim india and she has done her msc in palliative medicine from cardiff university uh, uk and she has been working in palliative care for uh, more than 5 years so welcome sri devi and it's over to you thank you so much uh, sir thank you raju and everyone for uh, uh, letting me to take this session and thank you all the participants for uh, showing interest to learn palliative care uh, uh, into your practice uh, i saw some charts uh, yes dr ravindran uh, we miss your amazing picture uh, because of the poor video and i could see audit in the Uh, in the session and hi hi from here nice to see you uh, at least through the zoom maybe after a year i guess <laughs> uh, more than that yeah so i'll i'll um, i'll share my presentation on nausea and vomiting uh, you can type your doubts uh, during the session or after the session we can have a discussion uh, Uh, we'll start with nausea and vomiting in uh, palliative care, and if time permits, we will also deal with constipation. If not, we'll deal with constipation and bowel obstruction together uh, in the next week uh, of session of uh, GI symptoms. So, as Dr. Sunil was mentioned, uh, nausea is uh, nausea and vomiting is a very very distressing distressing symptom that we uh, encounter in palliative care patients. Not just in palliative care patients, but maybe for uh, many other situations also. Uh, but in our setting, uh, the, we know that the patients are already uh, quite debilitated, tired from any physical uh, suffering other than pain. Uh, so this becomes totally debilitating for the patients as well as the family. And why why do we discuss nausea and vomiting? Uh, because we know that uh, everyone uses uh, their own favorite anti-emetics. Uh, sometimes it. it helps sometimes it doesn't so why why it is important in a palliative care setting to talk about nausea and vomiting because we know that uh, uh, many of our patients uh, has a lot of symptom burden including pain constipation nausea vomiting delirium so many symptoms and what happens when there is excessive nausea and vomiting we know that one day of vomiting or one day of nausea we feel really tired we are unable to get up do our stuff and already uh, in palliative care patients people are struggling to eat or drink due to their illness or due to their treatment so what happens if they have added on nausea and vomiting along with their suffering and we know that many of the medications that they are on regularly they can't skip those medications and this nausea and vomiting can lead to inability to take medications orally and which may lead to inadequate symptom control for example patient who is on a good pain relief with opioids unable to take opioids due to continuous vomiting so what whenever he takes morphine it is coming out so there is poor pain control so this is going to affect not just just uh, uh, the gi tract but also uh, every other system 
uh, I must say, sometimes they will be on oral chemotherapy or any, any medications which are important to them. Uh, uh, the poor uh, symptom control would be one uh, problem with nausea and vomiting. And of course, it escalates distress in patients and family. If the family member is seeing the patient vomiting continuously, unable to take anything, and uh, come, uh, all the medications and everything is coming out, it is quite distressing. And we know that the food has a lot of uh, uh, the language of love and affection. If your loved one is not eating and drinking, it affects the family member a lot than the cancer part. We, they know that the cancer is there. It may be curable. It may not be curable. But he is unable to eat or drink will be the major problem affecting the patient as well as the family. It is usually the problem for the family. Uh, it will cause uh, distress in the family members. But of course, patients will also be worried that I am unable to eat. I want to eat. I'm continuously vomiting. And how prevalent is nausea? We know that in cancer, we always uh, talk about nausea and vomiting. Or the, when the patients hear about the word chemotherapy, uh, the first thing that comes to their mind will be hair fall and vomiting. Even though the, the chemotherapy or immunotherapy may not be uh, an emetic agent, the, the fear that comes to their mind is usually nausea and vomiting followed by the therapies. So it is not just confined to cancer. That is why I have written about AIDS. In, in many stages of age, we can see uh, 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 nausea can 40 to 43 to 49% of uh, patients will have nausea and vomiting. Heart disease, especially end stage heart disease and uh, uh, and stage renal disease, high prevalence of nausea and vomiting. So it is not just confined to cancer or chemotherapy. It, uh, the, the, this symptom is also seen in many other illness like uh, AIDS, heart disease, and renal disease, and many more. I just mentioned which is uh, the most which are the most important ones. So what is our objective in treating nausea and vomiting? I have uh, written it uh, uh, specifically to stop or reduce frequency. Sometimes it's very difficult to stop nausea and vomiting. It's, it's, it's a, a, a tricky symptom. Uh, we need to play with a lot of medications and uh, thorough history. Uh, sometimes we may not be able to stop it completely, but we may be able to reduce the frequency. So that is a realistic, uh, realistic objective uh, as far as I am concerned. To establish compliance of treatment. So when once they stop uh, vomiting, only we can give medications. A patient coming to you with severe vomiting, you can't write uh, medications thinking that they will eat it and will get good pain relief, no. So we need the nausea and vomiting to be controlled so that they can uh, go on with the treatment, other, other treatment, including pain management. And of course, administering uh, oral medications and to improve the quality of life. So we'll see what is nausea, vomiting, and resting. We all will be familiar with these terms, but just to uh, brush up your memory, what is the difference between all this? Because very, it is very important to ask the patient and differentiate whether he has just nausea, nausea and vomiting, no nausea, but vomiting, only retching. So it's, it's very really important to understand and you have to uh, pick up your own uh, terms or language, uh, the local language that uh, patients use to understand or differentiate between all these. Uh, so nausea is the unpleasant feeling of the need to vomit. Usually there will be symptoms like cold, sweat, uh, salivation, tachycardia, but it may not be accompanied by vomiting. It is just nausea. Sometimes nausea may be accompanied by vomiting. Vomiting is the forceful expulsion of gastric contents through the mouth. Rachi, some uh, people uh, very often confuse us uh, uh, in terms of vomiting and retching. So it's really important to ask uh, uh, first thing is to understand what words they use locally uh, for vomiting and retching and ask specifically whether it is vomiting or retching. So retching is not, retching is not vomiting, but it is a rhythmic labor, uh, uh, spasmodic movement of the diaphragm and abdominal muscles. So they feel that the contents have uh, come to their mouth, uh, the undigested food particles or, or uh, acid feeling uh, liquids coming to their mouth without actual vomiting. So it's very important to ask whether they are vomiting or retching and ask whether it is just nausea, that is a feeling, uh, unpleasant feeling of the need to vomit or it is accompanied by vomiting. So what are the principles of management? It is same for all the symptoms. First thing to start with, correct the cause, treat the treatable, understand what is the cause of vomiting, understand why this person is vomiting. Uh, just do not assume, uh, you might have heard uh, uh, in the symptom management session, we can't assume that this is 
okay, this patient has cancer and undergoing chemotherapy. So probably he is vomiting because of that. There may be hundreds of other reasons why he is vomiting. So understand the cause of vomiting. Try non-pharmacological measures always along with the pharmacological measures. We, we tend to ignore the non-pharmacological measures very often, uh, but it has to accompany the pharmacological measures. If possible, if permits, uh, if the patient's health permits, situation permits, we can ask for dietary modifications also. And the, the important uh, part I want to emphasize today will be how to block the receptors at various sites. In choosing appropriate antiemetic, not just giving an antiemetic, but choosing appropriate antiemetic. What is the cause of vomiting? What is the receptor involved? What is the site involved? And then block those receptors so that it can have a better control of nausea and vomiting. So what are the non-pharmacologic measures? Uh, all are very, very simple things. Like what, what all we do when we have nausea and vomiting? We will definitely go, do not, do not go near uh, offending smells from the kitchen, right? We don't want to smell uh, um, uh, anything from the kitchen when you have a nausea and vomiting. So avoid situations which induce nausea and vomiting. Sometimes patients clearly say, I feel nauseous when I uh, when I have the smell from the kitchen, frying or cooking uh, specific food. So ask uh, what, what is triggering your nausea or what is triggering your vomiting. So uh, if possible, avoid those situations. And uh, the, the situation that the uh, surrounding where the patients live, in our setting, wherever we go for home care, we can see a lot, uh, lot of stuff will be there around the patient. Everything will be dumped over here and there. Uh, the the can into which the patient vomits will be kept under the coat. So that itself will induce nausea, right? The moment you keep seeing those things, then you feel more nauseous. So the environment uh, uh, cleanliness is also important. If possible, the coat should be placed near a window so that they'll get some fresh air. These are all simple things, but you try doing that, patients will feel much uh, relaxed and uh, uh, they feel good. And always nurse in an upright position. When patients are sick and they are tired of vomiting, they keep lying down and the caregivers have a tendency to feed them while they are lying down because out of love and affection. Why should they get up and eat? They are so tired. So that is one thing that you need to tell just to, uh, just to keep some pillows or, or a few pillows tight and then uh, if possible, feed the patient in an upright position. So these are simple things which can be carried out in any 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 home or any hospital. <laughs> Oral hygiene plays a major role. Uh, uh, I don't know whether you are all familiar with that uh, that part because when uh, it's very often seen by me that when patients get sick uh, or even at home or in our uh, hospital setting, uh, they stop taking care of their oral cavity. They stop brushing. They stop uh, cleaning their tongue uh, because they are too tired. So, uh, emphasize on good oral hygiene at any point of illness. Even when they are dying, you should take care of the oral cavity really well. Uh, we know that many patients will have suffering just because of poor oral hygiene. So, it's a very minor part, but uh, giving that uh, attention to that detail is really important. Keep the uh, oral cavity moist, fresh. Emphasize on cleaning the mouth regularly, regularly, even at the end of life care stage. Control of foul smells. Uh, so imagine a patient having a big wound over their face or anywhere in the body. Foul smelling wound, foul smelling wet sore. They are bound to have nausea and vomiting, right? Because 24 hours, 365 days, they are they are uh, exposed to the smell. Uh, or even a colostomy bag is quite uh, distressing for the patient. The smell from the bag, the sight of the feces, or the thought process that I am carrying feces over my body. So that uh, those are things that uh, we can we can take care of. So that we should uh, we should have, uh, rather than giving an antiemetic, I would focus more on keeping the wound clean, the colostomy to be covered, or uh, reduce the smell of the colostomy, uh, the, the fecal matter, or train him for colostomy irrigation. Give a proper bed uh, bed sore care so that the smell is not there. So giving an antiemetic in this situation may not work. You have to take care of the foul smelling wound or what are there uh, around the patient. Distractors sometimes work, but uh, for severe nausea and vomiting, it uh, may not. Uh, very, very important dietary modification. Uh, so in our place, uh, and I, I think all over India, uh, specifically in Kerala, we are fond of eating rice three times a day. If you don't eat rice, that means you are starving. So uh, people 
give a lot of rice, big plate, a lot of curries over that, huge quantity of rice. And seeing that side itself, patients don't want to eat anymore. They feel nauseous. So make the quantity of meals really small, very small quantity. I tell them, even if it is one or two spoons, that's fine. Keep it away. After one or two hours, just try one or two spoons. So when you take the take it together, add it together, you might have eaten well. Just one or two spoons at a time, uh, not more than that, not forcing, but frequently. Not like uh, three times a day regimen uh, works for uh, these patients. One or two hours, uh, either uh, next next time I'll tell them to give two spoons of juice. And again, two spoons of uh, rice gruel. So that, that would be enough. And that patient will also feel really okay. I just have to take two spoons. That is fine for me. So that small frequent meals are really important. And uh, sweet, spicy food. But sometimes I have heard patients uh, asking for Pepsi or Coke when they have nausea and vomiting. They feel sometimes good uh, by, ha by having these carbonated drinks. Uh, they ask for that actually. But uh, sometimes it may worsen. At that moment, they feel comfortable because of that uh, carbonated uh, property. But after that, they, uh, they end up in trouble. Uh, they, they tolerate bland food and clear fluids better, like uh, uh, like the rice gruel or ragi or uh, those kind of things. And uh, very unfortunately, many of our patients are prescribed uh, high protein drinks. And uh, personally, uh, I, I don't know, many of the drinks are totally unpalatable. Uh, anyway, you're eating uh, or drinking a few sips a day. So suppose you, we are there, like I imagine myself as the patient. You you can have only few spoons of uh, meal a day. I prefer that to be my favorite food, not a protein drink which is unpalatable or or something which is uh, having uh, I don't know strong order or something which is too sweet. No, so anyway they are not eating much. So tell them it is okay to have anything because anyway they are going to have only few spoonfuls. That is okay to have their favorite food. And uh, these are the, uh, the non-pharmacological measures that you should always try along with pharmacological measures because the management doesn't end with giving medications, but also uh, um, adjusting their diet, adjusting their wound, uh, taking care of their wound and, uh, and uh, the, the uh, small frequent uh, policy. And now we see how to manage it. Uh, I know it's quite boring in the afternoon, uh, three o'clock. I'm talking about, I'm going to talk about a lot of receptors and pharmacology. Uh, so I hope no one, uh, <laughs> no one is getting off me, but just remember these five centers at the minimum. So these are the five key players in this game. Uh, uh, the vomiting center, uh, the cerebral cortex, the CTZ, GIT, and the place. So the five centers, it should be clear, clear in your head. So if, if these are clear, then, and if, if you know which are the receptors in these centers, it's very easy to manage nausea and vomiting. It's like uh, you, uh, you you really feel like, yes, I did it. I knew why this patient was vomiting. I knew which center was involved. I knew which drug had, had to be given. It's not just on time, on time set from university for all the nausea and vomiting. There are n number of causes why people are not, uh, nauseous and why people are vomiting. So five centers, again, vomiting center, CTZ, GIT, cerebral cortex, and vestibular ventilator. So now we'll see uh, individually. I'm not reading the, uh, the interconnecting neural network, blah, 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 but vomiting center, we know that uh, what it is. It is located in the medulla and it is a final common pathway for all the vomiting centers. And uh, uh, it has a uh, uh, lot of uh, parasympathetic and motor efferent activities uh, to produce the vomiting reflex. CT is that uh, most of us will be familiar because uh, it's where the drugs and whatever things you give in the blood will go and act. So it is uh, situated in the fourth ventricle. It is positioned, very importantly, it is positioned outside the blood brain barrier. So what happens then? It is accessible to enteric substances in your blood and mm -hmm. cell, the CSF. So uh, the drugs that you give, the, the, uh, the toxins in your blood, is going to reach the CTZ. So that is one important point to be remembered in the CTZ. Uh, immune suppress because of the stomach. We know a lot of vagal and uh, afferent fibers are there in the bowel wall and uh, they transmit signals to the brain stem or directly to the uh, cortex. Uh, cerebral cortex, memory fear modification. I uh, had the habit of vomiting. Uh, during chemotherapy. So then uh, next time if I go for chemotherapy or if I think about chemotherapy, I, I, I feel nauseous. Or I'm scared if I eat this, 
okay, I'm going to vomit. If I uh, see this, I'm going to vomit. So next time when I see this, I actually vomit. So all this memory, fear, and modification happens in cerebral cortex. And the last one, the vestibular nucleus, uh, it is mainly, we all know, it's mainly concerned with the parallel cell movement. So the five centers, vomiting center, CDZ, stomach, cerebral cortex, and vestibular nucleus. So the five key areas. So now comes to the most confusing part of today's session, the receptors. <laughs> but uh, we uh, try to remember the most important ones. Uh, these are the most important, one, important ones. It is not easy to memorize and you don't need to memorize all these things. But once you start practicing, then you can start relating uh, this to, okay, why, why this is happening? Go back to the book, that is how we used to do. I go back to the PowerPoint and then see, okay, what, what, where was it? Oh, okay, what is the receptor? What is the drug? That's fine. But after a few uh, practice, you will get a hang of it, why, why, and where. So dopamine. Uh, dopamine can be divided into D1 and D5. And uh, D2 is presented in the CT set. And uh, D2 is also seen in GLP. So dopamine 2 uh, is uh, the one uh, which we are concerned about. This is present in, presented in CTZ as well as in the GIT. And uh, serotonin receptors 5 HT1 to 4. And out of that, I'm, I'm just talking about the most important ones. Out of the 5, uh, 5 HT1 to 4, the serotonin receptors, 5 HT3 and 5 HT4 are the ones we are concerned with. Of course, we are concerned with others too, but for today's day, we can uh, we can just memorize 5-HT3 and 5-HT4. Uh, because 5-HT3 is presented in the gut, is present in the gut, it is present in the um, CDZ, and 5-HT4 is also concerned with vomit. So there are many other receptors, uh, receptors and neurotransmitters like tachykinins and neurokinins. We are all familiar with the neurokinin 1, 2, 3. Out of that, neurokinin 1 is distributed in the central nervous system. The, uh, the, the CTZ and the GID. Now I have confused you enough, right? But uh, but yeah, just remember serotonin, dopamine. Uh, these uh, these uh, two are the most important ones out of that D2 and 5 HPT and 5 HP4. That is one. Uh, the three, or, three, or three important things that I want you to remember. Others are also important, but for today's sake, at least start remembering these things. There are other, many other neurotransmitters like histamine. Acetylcholine. We know that we use uh, antihistamines for controlling vomiting, uh, uh, GABA, cannabinoids, uh, many of them. This is a diagram. Uh, sometimes it helps me to go to this diagram and see what is where and which is what. So I hope uh, you can uh, just uh, see. You can see uh, that, uh, for example, you know, a patient is undergoing an abdominal radiotherapy or if there is an intestinal distension or if there is a chemotherapy going on, renal failure and uremia, what happens? 5-HT3 is the, uh, the top and left part, you can see 5-HT3 in the gut wall. See, uh, so these are the common uh, causes that we come across in, in, in our setting. Uh, morphine, you can see the second uh, from the left, morphine or digoxin, drugs like morphine acts at the D2 receptors. Hypercalcemia, uremia, D2 in the CTZ. So this is uh, one uh, diagram which I used uh, initially to get over the hang of receptors and uh, and the drugs. Fear and anxiety, uh, then you have to uh, think about cerebral cortex or raised ICT. Again, you have to think about the cerebral cortex. And uh, the second column, you can see what are the receptors involved there. GABA, neurokinin 1 and serotonin receptors in the cerebral cortex. Again, the last one, vestibular nucleus, any movement or vertigo, or even morphine can uh, can uh, cause a vomiting through that pathway. Acetylcholine and histamine are the receptors, and ultimately the common emetic pathway is the vomiting. Uh, every, everyone reaches there ultimately, the vomiting center. And again, in the vomiting center, you can see acetylcholine, histamine, opioid receptors, serotonin, neurokinin. So we can't buy hard this anyway. But this picture, I used to keep it in my mobile and just go back and search, okay, why, why, which is the drug, which is the receptor. This doesn't have all the causes, but uh, the common causes that we encounter in our city. So again, uh, classification. How do we classify antiemetics? We know that uh, 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 in this diagram, we have seen the uh, receptors involved. According to the receptors, there are uh, drugs I have written on the right-hand side. 
what are the anti muscarinic uh, the commonly used drug hyacin which we call buspartan uh, anti histamine cyclizin as i have not used personally cyclizin 5hd2 antagonists uh, we use olanzapine but we don't have levomepramazine in our country but it seems to have a good effect in muscle and vomiting epipretrit uh, ctz uh, so come back to the d2 receptor i told d2 receptor is really important that is very, really important because most of our patients will be on morphine and the morphine acts on the d2 receptors so we need something to block the d2 receptor so what is blocking the d2 receptor haloperidol metoclopramide to the, the three important drugs that we use very commonly in a palliative care setting and where is our on the favorite on den syndrome uh, 5hd3 antagonist uh, uh, so you know that uh, on den syndrome acts at the 5hd3 not in the d2 so when a patient is coming to you with the uh, opioid induced nausea and vomiting and you give on den syndrome no tramadol very often you see it with the prescription of tramadol along with emicet uh, tramadol stat with emicet stat Uh, so it's it's highly unlikely that it can be uh, it can be uh, yeah. uh, cerebral cortex uh, we have lorazepam which is a benzodiazepine cannabinoids we we don't use but uh, corticosteroids very commonly used uh, drug uh, in terms of uh, nausea and vomiting associated with cerebral cortex example would be raised intracranial pressure we have to use steroids and or or a plus or minus mannitol to reduce the intracranial pressure so that the patient stops <laughs> so prokinetic drugs which will help to uh, help the gut to move properly these are again we are the our d2 receptor antagonist comes uh, so you notice that uh, there is haloperidol and metoclopramide in the ctz but when it comes to the gi tract the d2 receptor i have written only metoclopramide don't worry so haloperidol acts at the level of ctz not uh, in the git so suppose a patient is vomiting because of the problems with the morphine induced uh, gut uh, motility issues then i have to give metoclopramide uh, and anti secretory drugs we mentioned uh, uh, hyoscine and octreotide uh, is one another commonly used drug in many setting uh, so i am not reading one by one i'm making the board uh, i have just tried to reduce it to 10 m so if that helps someone <laughs> to get rid of this confusion so if it is metastasis uh, it can be due to uh, brain or in the liver then uh, if it is due to cerebral raised intracranial tension then i would use steroid and mannitol again if there is a meningeal mets i would use steroid because we know that there is a, a possibility of raised icg medications the third uh, medication what are the medications that can cause nausea and vomiting opioids we very commonly use opioids and we know that opioids can nausea and vomiting where does it uh, act in the ctz vestibular and uh, gi tract so and what are the drugs used so this way i have arranged it what is the cause where does it act and what is the drug uh chemotherapy induced vomiting then you have to use 5h3 blocker and steroid sometimes patients have uh, vomiting just because they are having nsaids we tend to ignore that uh, possibility uh because we might not have pre uh, prescribed a pp ppi with the uh, nsaid so then then there is no point in giving uh, another antiemetic i would suggest giving omeprazole and see or any any ppi and then see whether uh, it's up. movement another m vestibular stimulation uh, uh, sometimes we do see uh, morphine associated uh, 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 movement related uh, nausea or giddiness they say uh, then the drug of choice would be promethazine uh, mentation anxiety i'm anxious about going for a chemo i'm anxious about uh, my my wound uh, next time when i or when someone opens a wound and clean and i i i know that i may vomit because of the smell i'm anticipating that then you have to treat with lorazepam there can be mechanical obstruction like uh, an intestinal obstruction maybe a constipation then there is no point in giving a metoclopramide or nonbenzetron because he's constipated try to avoid try to manage the constipation first and then evaluate so this essentially conveys that you have to understand the cause of vomiting rather than just prescribing uh, an antiemetic take a proper history understand what are the causes uh, why what are the triggers when he is vomiting etc 
so another uh, very commonly seen hypercalcemia related nausea and vomiting then then the treatment of choice would be a uh, correction of uh, hyponatremia or hypercalcemia uh, mortality induced mucosal like nsids we have mentioned now, last but not least microbes we tend to ignore that uh, very often sometimes people have nausea just because they have uh, severe oral thrush then a topical or systemic antifungal would uh, uh, help you to tackle the nausea and vomiting than giving any other antibiotic and sometimes uh, uh, infection sepsis or any gi infection can also lead to uh, symptoms of nausea so uh, i know that it is quite confusing but you can keep reading and reading it takes a lot of time to get a hang of these receptors and the drugs uh, i think it took me ages to understand what to be said where uh, so rule of thumb uh, assessment is the key so when you assess ask more specific questions uh, more specific questions like someone is telling you i have vomiting just don't stop by there okay he has vomiting no how many times a day when do you vomit all the time what is the frequency what is the color of vomit is is it high quantity like high volume vomiting do you vomit a lot what is the color or is it just a small quantity vomit is is it just nausea is it immediately after food intake or irrespective of food intake so so many questions you have to ask if they talk about one symptom and sometimes uh, the nurses working with me find it quite annoying but i i ask too much questions when they talk about a symptom but it is really important to understand where this is coming from why this person is vomiting correct the correctable maybe an offending smell from a colostomy bag or a wound may be a reason correcting the correct the correctable correct the keep the wound clean keep the colostomy clean manage the consequence or complication if, if the person is having a sepsis then then think about that think about managing that provide targeted therapy so i always use the word appropriate antiemetic because uh, it's not just any antiemetic it is it has to be appropriate antiemetic root it's very uh, tricky i i can't write uh, an oral tablet when he is continuously vomiting and specifically says the tablets are coming out so i have to choose which, which root and that depends on whether the person can get admitted whether the person can do all this at home if i choose the alternate route whether the person can afford if i choose the alternate route so a lot of things come into play when you have to choose the appropriate route of medication it is not that easy either i have to tell the patients to come and admit uh, in our uh, inpatient unit it may not be possible so i have to inquire whether i give some subcutaneous medications is there anyone at home which i can train and give the medication and then uh, once the symptoms subside then he can switch back to the oral medication so these are the things that we need to consider uh, when you start writing medications it's not about just choosing the appropriate antiemetic but understand whether this is feasible whether this is okay for that patient to do uh, uh, which which is more convenient for that patient and attention to details like i said annoying questions what is the color so i remember uh, and uh, two weeks back uh, one patient came with a jar uh, a box full vomitus because last time i asked what is the color of vomitus and they couldn't say and i didn't understand so they brought that okay this is what he vomits every time but that is really important because he had a uh, black color vomitus uh, they, they they were confused when i asked it is it black color or uh, red or something but then then they were not sure because he was just going to the toilet and vomit and come back no one used to as is what it is so uh, understanding uh, the, the like any other symptom uh, take a proper very very detailed history understand whether it is retching or vomiting whether it is intermittent associated with food without food associated with orders whether there is any pain very importantly bowel habits uh, whether the patient is constipated having a good bowel opening that's the, the most important question i ask when they come with nausea and vomiting and uh, sometimes they say it's just once in the morning okay that's so that, that these are the questions that you need to ask uh, uh, and understand very clearly uh, do a physical examination uh, check for any uh, organomegaly check for bowel sounds whether there is increased bowel sounds decrease no bowel sounds ask for constipation ask for bowel history do a rectal examination if needed uh, and check for uh, whether there was any renal failure or liver failure or any hypercalcemia not i don't do this uh, investigations for all patients but suppose a patient's com- patient is coming to me with a lot of uh, metastasis to the bone and then telling pain and vomiting then i may suspect a hypercalcemia then i check the serum cache not for all the patients 
not for all the patients uh, checking for liver function and renal function. If you suspect that this is the cause, then you may need to check that. If needed, abdominal x-ray, because when you, if you suspect an obstruction or a, any constipation or anything. Uh, to, to rule out sepsis, you can uh, do necessary laboratory testing. Only when you think that, okay, this is what I suspect, this is what I want to know, check it and start treating. <laughs> Uh, I, I'll be talking about a few drugs that we commonly use because these are the commonly used drugs and you need to know what it is. Uh, metoclopramide, uh, usually uh, given uh, when there is dysmotility or delayed gastric emptying, especially associated with uh, drugs like morphine. Uh, it has a combined effect at D2. At higher doses, very higher doses, like more than 100 milligrams, it has a 5-HT3 and HT3 antagonism also. It is primarily prokinetic agent uh, because it triggers the cholinergic system in the gut and uh, that's how it acts. And we uh, might be familiar with the term dopamine break. Uh, so any drugs acting at the D2 uh, receptors release that break. That means you put an accelerator. So the gastric empty is done. Uh, the drugs like opioid has put a break uh, in the GIT by acting through the dopamine receptors. And these are the drugs which will release that dopamine break. Uh, I don't, I don't want to read the bioavailability and stuff, but yeah, uh, sometimes, very rarely, we see uh, uh, extrapyramidal uh, symptoms. Very, very rarely, it's not uh, even need to be mentioned, but still, uh, that too, also higher doses, not at regular dose that we use. So we have to be, uh, it's not contraindicated in patients with epilepsy or Parkinson's disease, never, uh, not an absolute contraindication, but we have to keep it in mind that you have to look for any abnormality uh, uh, when you give it for patients with uh, epilepsy or Parkinson's disease. You have to be really cautious when you give it for patients with GI hemorrhage or perforation because, or if you're suspecting a complete obstruction. So there is a complete obstruction, you give a prokinetic, it keep going and hitting the obstructed area and it can lead to GI perforation. So be careful when you prescribe it immediately after GI surgery or in cases of uh, complete obstruction. And the red thing I have written, please don't combine. It's, it, it, it's very uh, basic thing, but we very often see this combination. Do not combine uh, prokinetic metoclopramide and anti because it has opposite effect. Uh, another D2 antagonist is uh, doperidone. Uh, it has action in the chemoreceptor trigger zone as well as the GLT. Again, it also acts to counteract the dopamine break. Uh, it, it has less uh, drowsiness in terms of undes undesirable side effects. Uh, again, uh, almost the same contraindication when you have a fresh GI surgery or perforation or complete bowel obstruction. None of the prokinetics can be given because uh, it can cause GI perforation. Very important antiemetic that we use, very effective is haloperidol. It is a typical antipsychotic. It is a D2 receptor blocker. And uh, it is the dose is slightly different from uh, the, the uh, dose that we use for delirium. It is 1.5 to 5 milligram a day uh, or twice a day can be used. We, in generally, we don't need higher doses of haloperidol for uh, controlling nausea and vomiting when compared to delirium, uh, when it's used for delirium. Olanzapine is another atypical antipsychotic, very useful in refractory nausea and vomiting. It has a broad spectrum of action. Almost all the receptors uh, are involved uh, in the action of olanzapine. Very effective uh, when you have a intractable or refractory nausea and vomiting. Levomepromazine is not uh, available in our country, but it is a very strong D2 receptor uh, antagonist. Steroids, we, we, we know in many uh, symptoms like pain also, we use a lot of steroid and it has a broad spectrum action in terms of uh, anti-MSs. Uh, again, the exact mechanism is not known, but it may be related to the uh, GABA receptors or uh, uh, reducing the pressure most often in uh, in cerebral uh, meds. The dose would be, uh, antiemetic dose would be much uh, lower than the uh, uh, malignant bowel obstruction dose. It is usually 4 milligram or uh, 8 milligram per day would be fine. Obtutide, uh, very commonly used in intestinal obstruction, is also an antiemetic. Uh, very commonly used in obstruction, not in prognosia and vomiting. Uh, uh, Maybe in refractory nausea and vomiting. Hyosin, 
it's an anti-muscarinic uh, buscopan is the uh, name that we all are familiar with uh, it decreases the secretion and relaxes the smooth muscle so uh, it can be given as either continuous intuition or intermittent dose generally oral medication is not uh, preferred when it comes to buscopan because the bioavailability uh, oral bioavailability is very very poor when you uh, give it orally uh, cannabinoids uh, uh, I'm not familiar with cannabinoids, but uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's uh, mentioned in the textbooks as an antiemetic. Uh, benzodiazepines, when you are uh, uh, having an anxiety related or memory or fear related nausea and vomiting, may be cannabis lorazepam. So uh, I know that after this quite a boring long session, we will go through a patient story uh, so that you can all wake up and think and uh, uh, type it in the chat session. What how can we help this person? So I look at the chat and then we proceed. So this is uh, a 56 year old uh, male with the carcinoma call. So we'll go through his life, different scenarios, the same person, okay? So this person has a, a colicky pain of abdomen, uh, abdominal distension, bilious vomiting and bowels not open for a week. Uh, anyone to pitch in? What can be uh, what can be the reason? What can, I know you may not remember the receptors, but if someone remembers, then you can type what can be the receptors. Yeah, can we use hyosin for abdominal? Is is it related to this particular uh, scenario, or was that a question asked earlier? Uh, yes. Uh, so I, can, I cannot say, yes, hyacinth can be used for abdominal pain. I will see why this person is having abdominal pain. Is it due to the, uh, 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 due to the uh, increased uh, bowel uh, GA motility? And I need to slow down the GIT. Yes, I would use muscopan. So we need to uh, think, why this abdominal pain? Is it related to increased motility? Suppose a patient is having abdominal pain because of opioids. We have given opioids. Gut is not moving. Silent gut, no, uh, less motility. And if I give buscopan, then the pain would not go away. And you may actually aggravate the pain. So it depends on why this abdominal pain is happening. Uh, I didn't see. Uh, so it can be a gastric uh, stasis or an outlet obstruction. So what, what is generally seen in this uh, situation? We will deal with it in uh, uh, very detailed next session. But uh, this patient will may feel okay most of the time and uh, they may feel better after vomiting. So that is one question that you can ask. Do you feel better after vomiting? So that can be, uh, that can be one thing that we can uh, think that is, it may be an obstruction. And... Uh, I eat and then after one hour I vomit or sometimes I eat and I eat immediately, uh, uh, I, I vomit immediately after I eat something. So these are the things that you can ask if you're suspecting a gastric stasis. So what is the mechanism? We have mentioned uh, all these receptors. Uh, uh, the obstruction can cause uh, stimulation of the stretch receptors and uh, uh, serotonin, neurokinin, uh, vagal stretch receptors are all involved in this mechanism. And here I would give a uh, steroid uh, so that uh, there is a reduction in the, uh, the peritumor edema, if any. And then I try to give a prokinetic. I am not mentioning this in detail because we'll, we are going to discuss this in the next session of bowel obstruction next week. So this will be the treatment regimen. So again, this uh, male with uh, carcinoma colon, he has received a chemotherapy three days ago and has come to take care for the third cycle of chemotherapy. So he already had a chemotherapy, again come for chemotherapy, and just came for chemotherapy, and he is vomiting. So what can be the reason? I've mentioned it several times uh, during this session. Why, why this person is vomiting? He had a chemotherapy, now he has come for chemotherapy, and telling you that uh, I have no skin vomiting. Uh, for, uh, just, I just came for chemotherapy. So what can be the reason? Yeah, fear, memory, yes. So he is scared. Last time I had vomiting, now I'm, I have come to chemotherapy. So I may vomit. Uh, so the, the drugs uh, would be, uh, the, the chemotherapeutic agents can be one reason. And uh, sometimes it may be related to anxiety and memory. So initial scenario, during chemotherapy, he vomited because of the chemotherapeutic agents. The second time he came to chemotherapy, and he started vomiting, it can be related to anxiety. And the drugs for chemotherapy induced vomiting on dancetron or granisetron uh, 
uh, can be given. If it is due to anxiety or fear of chemotherapy, then uh, you can uh, give lorazepam either uh, point anywhere between 0.5 to answer like this. Yes, right answer. Many people have written lorazepam as well. So, uh, so this person is telling you uh, severe headache and weakness of the right half of the body along with vomiting. So what can be the reason for vomiting? Yeah, it can be increased intracranial tension. Uh, yeah, so steroids uh, would be the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your Uh, so it can be due to the meningeal irritation. It can be due to increased uh, IC, uh, intracranial tension. So yes, you have mentioned. Oh, I think I missed a slide on to Excel. Okay, it should be the treatment of choice would be the steroids and uh, plus or minus mannitol. Uh, dizziness and vertigo, head movement cause vomit. Very easy one. Sometimes patients after uh, starting opioids can tell you that I have vertigo. Motion related, the the the, uh, the receptors would be histamine and uh, muscarinic, and you mentioned the work also. Yeah, yes, Thank you for this call, responding in the chat. It's quite easy uh, to understand that uh, someone is responding and then you're talking. Thank you so much. So now we have started him on morphine. Uh, 10 milligram every four hours uh, and he's uh, telling I have bloating sensation and I feel I have uh, I feel full uh, when I eat one or two spoons so uh, what should we give I try to look at the chat and then this happens <laughs> So we, you might have heard about uh, uh, the drugs, uh, the reason for nausea and vomiting when you have heard about opioids. So drugs, uh, sometimes chemotherapeutic agents, NSAIDs, digoxin, uh, anti some of the anti drugs. Opioids uh, can cause uh, nausea and vomiting, and it acts mostly at the CTZ dopamine and uh, uh, CTZ, uh, the dopamine uh, and uh, the serotonin receptors will be involved. So, uh, yeah, don't worry, don't do increase gastric emptying. Yes. So, I would, uh, yeah, dopamine is also the right answer. I did not type it in here. Haloperidol or metoclopramide, or uh, if it is too much trouble, so it's not the first line that I would not change the opioid initially, but yeah, if it is. Uh, uh, too much troublesome to manage. It is just because of the opioid if the patient is totally not tolerating, then you can think about uh, uh, switching the opioid to another one. So, this person is telling you that I have increased pain over the right upper abdomen, continuous pain. Uh, the pain increases on inspiration, and I don't want to eat. I have loss of appetite. What can be so the pain is over the upper right abdomen. This it increases on uh, uh, on eating. And what would be the drug? What can be the reason for that? Yeah, it can be due to liver myths or liver enlargement. Uh, it can. Uh, so when you breathe, you know uh, the diaphragm, uh, the liver will. Uh, the diaphragm will goes to the liver, and because it's a huge liver, and the patient may come up with a lot of lot of pain in the right hypochondrial region, along with nausea and vomiting. So then the drug of choice would be steroid uh, to reduce the capsular enlargement, and uh, uh, so uh, another scenario. Uh, this patient has history of heart disease and he's taking aspirin to 25 milligram per day, telling uh, that uh, I have nausea and vomiting along with severe uh, epigastric pain. So uh, uh, I, I put all these scenarios just because that, see, this is the same person, same diagnosis, right? This is a 56 year old male with carcinoma colon from the beginning to the end. But see how many types of vomiting he can come up with. You can't just play with one drug for one drug solution for all. You have to understand uh, why. So this see this scenario. 
this is totally uh, totally uh, different from what his Ill, his actual diagnosis is so this is totally different he has he's been on the aspirin if you don't ask what are the medications he's taking you may miss it and you we keep giving a haloperidol or metoclopramide or on dancetron and patient is still having the symptom and we miss a major thing he might end up in peptic ulcers or or any any other uh, more more and more issues if you miss this is very very basic thing so this is the same person same diagnosis coming to you with nausea and vomiting from the beginning to the end but all uh, are uh, are dependent on different reasons again the same person with the history of fever and diarrhea so this you have to think about any infection or sepsis you have to check whether he has any infection and then treat with appropriate antibiotic so this uh, uh, may not respond to the typical anti emetic uh, therapy sore mouth loss of taste and anorexia so this is one thing that i mentioned uh, very clearly sometimes and very often it is not even rare that patients will come up with nausea and vomiting symptoms just because of uh, oral thrush they say i have uh, foul taste in my mouth uh, i have pain while swallowing i am unable to eat loss of appetite and uh, i i don't know i don't have taste i i have pain so this is one thing that we uh, need to think uh, keep in your mind always anti fungal therapy is very very important it's not even rare very often they come up with uh, this so, so uh, the, the, these are uh, these would be the uh, the key points that uh, need to uh, be taken from today's session understand the cause of vomiting understand the pathway where it is going where it is coming from understand the receptor what are the key players involved in this uh, uh, in this play where to block and what to block choose the most potent anti antiemetic so we know that the same receptors different antiemetics are there sometimes one will be more potent than the other so understand which one is more potent antagonist and then give the appropriate anti choose a route of administration as i said depending on the patient's convenience the affordability the access uh, to the medication everything considering everything we can choose a route of administration and try to treat the dose carefully and review the patient frequently uh, so if i suspect a complete obstruction or if i suspect a partial obstruction i give metoclopramide i have to be really uh, cautious i have to ask the patient okay do you feel increased pain or you do feel better that is how i would i would see whether it is a complete probably it can be a complete obstruction so ask and review the patient frequently uh, uh, after giving medications uh, is very important so antiemetic not sos like pain medication if they are vomiting give it regularly and if uh, even after your treatment if the symptoms still persist then you have to go back and think okay did i miss something uh, is are there any other reasons like aspirin is he is on any other medications that can be the reason for the symptom so go back every time and check whether we have missed anything and uh, when you combine it is okay to combine antiemetics now we know the receptors are different the mechanism of action is different it is okay to combine but when we combine understand whether the drug uh, interacts with each other whether they are counteracting their action so uh, so make that like any other any other medication combination make that uh, sensible combination Thank you for uh, uh, the patient listening. Uh, Thank you, Sri uh, Devi. Mm, so, I would uh, like to introduce Dr. Audit Stewart. So, Dr. Audit uh, is an associate professor at the Peter McCallum Institute uh, from Melbourne, Australia. So she has a lot of experience in palliative care, and has been uh, we have cross collaboration with her and helping in many things, including academy. So, uh, audit, uh, do you want to uh, make any points? Yeah, hello, Sunil. Thank you, and Hi. thank you, for Debbie, for letting me listen in. Uh, well done, great presentation. Um, the, 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 I was just thinking often it is multifactorial. Um, I think that did come out in your talk, how many causes can be present in the same patient. So often it is difficult to really pinpoint exactly one cause. Um, but the good thing is that there is a sort of final common pathway for the medica for the, for the, for the vomiting 
kind of mechanisms. And so um, even if we can't pinpoint one particular cause, uh, we can usually manage well. But the other thing too is what I find here is we people use a lot of ondansetron and I asked the question about the cost because sometimes the cost of these drugs is cheaper in India than it is in our setting here in Australia. But we do get a lot of problems with constipation with ondansetron and um, in the palliative care population where they're already not eating properly or they're immobilized or they're dehydrated constipation is a major, major problem. And some people are exquisitely sensitive to constipating effects of ondansetron. So I'm very fond of stopping it in patients if I can and, and stick to haloperidol and metoclopramide and um, those, those medications as the first line. Um, but having said that, it is you know, a very effective antiemetic and sometimes we have to use it. Um, and the other thing, just one last point, I was thinking how important it is to prevent nausea, um, particularly when you're starting opioids, a lot of patients will be very, you know, they say about 30% of patients get um, nausea with opioids. Um, I'm not sure how accurate that figure is really, but I think you'll find that in the textbooks. And so if people have some worries about starting an opioid, then um, the nausea might be enough to put them off. And so sometimes it's good to be prescribing some antiemetic for two or three days, because usually that is a self-limiting um, problem. After two or three days, it tends to ease off. Fortunately, the pain relief continues, but the nausea eases off. So particularly in community patients, it might be worth, you know, we, we have a lot of populations here who are very worried about opioids. And so you need to try and uh, make it a positive experience or else they'll quickly stop. Um, that's just a few points that come to my mind. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you, Adit. Uh, so uh, any of you have uh, any doubts, you can ask now. Seventy ninety square carpet. Seventy ninety. Seventy ninety. Anybody? I mean, like as somebody else has mentioned, I really like that ten M's way of thinking about things, Sri Devi. That's really helpful. Yeah, that uh, the. Thanks to Dr. Nagi for teaching that 10 M's and that, that was his way of teaching us. I think years back I heard from him. So I had a note in which I mentioned all the 10 M's and uh, his statement. So thanks to Dr. Nagi. Nice. Actually, overall, the way you have presented it has made it so simple. I mean, like, uh, especially with the case, you know, every time the patient comes with vomiting, you have to ask a new set of questions or re-ask the questions again. It's a very valid way of teaching. Thank you so much. It is very, very thought-provoking. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, it's quite tricky to remember all these uh, uh, receptors, but uh, when you start uh, seeing very often and start managing, then uh, you get to understand. I, I, I used to go back and look at the receptors and pictures. Still, I do that, but yeah. That's, that's I think quite those, those, uh, those tenants and that uh, picture of the receptors, I think we have to put it up in a place where you see it every day so you remember that. When you see it. So the way I do is I take screenshots and keep it in the mobile because whenever you go for home care and everything, you have you have your mobile handy. So many things like the tool chart, we have it in the mobile handy, then it is easier to uh, look at it and ask or show and ask, uh, just put a screenshot in the mobile and see Ma'am, how common is the EPS effects of uh, perinom, the extraperimental side effects? Uh, so if you are asking about literature, uh, the evidence, uh, I, I, I am not sure. But if you're asking about a practical uh, experience with that, 
then probably I have seen uh, maybe one uh, in last nine years or so. Uh, Dr. Sunil can also add on that. It's very rare. I have not seen uh, much and that too with higher doses only. We generally manage with doses much lower than that, but, but very rare. Uh, yeah, uh, I think, yeah, uh, uh, it's not very common to have extra pyramidal side effects as we fear. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I have seen only one or two. And uh, even uh, one patient only with the 10 milligram, and, but uh, um, in the standard section, we give uh, something like uh, 60 to 100 milligram. And I haven't seen uh, EPS uh, with those patients. So it is not uh, common to have extra pyramidal side effects the way we fear. What is, what is your experience? Oh, I couldn't quite catch what the side effects We are talking was. about the extra pyramidal side effects of uh, metaclopamide. Experimental, right. Yeah, not, not, I mean, we may miss it, of course. Um, I certainly remember one very one elderly lady being uh, very severely rigid for a couple of days with three milligrams of haloperidol but when I was doing aged care many years ago. So that always stays in my mind. But I think, um, we, yeah, we, we don't, at the doses we're using haloperidol, we don't tend to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Now for vestibular vomiting, what did you mention? Which is the best? Uh, that would be promethazine. Promethazine, okay. So this, all these uh, drugs which you have mentioned can be used even in for non-cancer yeah. patients? It's, it's yeah, yeah, definitely. Planning. Because uh, this depends on the receptors and the centers, not uh, really. So that is why we mentioned about the 56-year-old male with CA colon, but he came with different uh, different reasons uh, for vomiting. So respect, it, is, it is not related to his cancer many a times. So uh, it depends on the receptors and the centers, not exactly on the diagnosis. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Ma will you be talking about hiccups also in later classes? Uh, no, know, I think uh, we'll be having time only for constipation and uh, bowel obstruction. Mm -hmm. That too, like very crushed time. Okay, because hiccups also is commonly encountered. Now. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe we can, uh, sir, can we send some article or uh, a paper, uh, the practice How to guidelines hiccups. or something? Yeah, okay. I think that might be the uh, materials that uh, is being provided to you uh, uh, during the course. Yeah, probably it should be in full time for the pilot here. Yeah. Oh, I'll just check it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Ma'am, how about uh, trifopromacin? We used to use it uh, some years back. It's not working. Trifopromacin. No? I am not familiar. I think it's uh, it before be, I was it's born. Never, I don't know. I don't know. I have not heard, sir. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I, I think the veterinaries are using you now. We used, uh, I, I uh, think um, um, uh, olanzapine is similar and. Pro and um, Cephidothysin. Levomipromazine, but chlorpromazine still is a very good antiemetic, um, good for hiccups, but it is sedating. So, but low dose. Do you still, you still have it? Use oh, really? it? Mm -hmm. Really, yeah. really, really. Yeah, it's a very good antiemetic. You make me feel old, Sri Devi. But I think the extra pyramidal symptoms were more with that. Was it so? Pardon? And extra pyramidal symptoms. Plus more. Um, plus, yeah. Oh, I don't know if it's more. I always think of haloperidol as the worst. Uh, but probably being an older one, it probably does have more extra pyramidal than olanzapine. Yeah. Something to look up. Thank you. Yeah. 
thank you thank you ma'am thank you so uh, i didn't get the drug which you are were talking about which one triflu promosin okay okay it was uh, marketed as stock injection sequel tablet sequel okay. s i c q u a l sequel Oh, uh, maybe, maybe I was thought you were talking about chlorpromazine. Ah, uh, chlorpromazine, yeah. something. That's. Uh, can, can you put it in the chat? Uh, yes, I yes, I, 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 yes, yes. Right. Okay. Try full promising. Yeah. Okay, uh, I see that it is used for severe MSS and uh, severe cups, but uh, I am not experienced uh, with the uh, price of promotion. Okay, uh, so uh, I think uh, so. Uh, the essence of this uh, class uh, is that uh, for each and every type of committee, so all the patients, uh, for all the patients, we should not be using. on that set uh, first of all we have to find out what's the cause of vomiting just think uh, is it due to opioid is it due to constipation or is it due to gastric irritation or is it due to some tumor stretching in the in the stain etc and uh, then think of the uh, receptors uh, or the pathway involved uh, in the uh, in that process uh, and from the uh we can find out which center is involved and as we know uh, at last the vomiting center will be stimulated uh so uh, the vomiting center is the emetic pattern generator which will decide uh, are you going to have nausea or are you going to have vomit uh, so depending on the uh, um, receptors uh, you have to uh, find out the medication which is going to block that particular medication so it is uh, very much possible in uh, uh, in the normal patients also not only in cancer patients um, so uh, the importance is that uh, we should not uh, use on dansetron for uh, every patient which is the trend now and on dansetron also causes constipation in addition to headache thank you um, as today i think we can move on to the patient story uh, which will be presented by dr bilal and uh, dr anjan thank you anna uh, yes doctor you are i think uh okay good evening to everyone after a wonderful presentation by dr sri devi we just kept us all enthralled we just go to a patient story which actually doesn't do any justice to what ma'am has said so far dr bilal and myself we represent travancore medical college i am actually a teaching faculty as i mentioned before so my uh, clinical affiliation was dr bilal Dr. Bilal is busy today with his COVID duties, and so I think he logged in, but he cannot be. He is not able to present today. So I continue with my presentation. With all due respect to Dr. Bilal, so we talk about a 56-year-old male who has a diagnosis of metastatic gastric cancer. So he is a known case of carcinoma stomach with type two diabetes mellitus, bronchial asthma, and hypertension. This last presentation to the hospital about a month back was with complaints of generalized weakness, and he was admitted for nutritional support because of the poor status of nutrition which he was in. Next slide, please. So his actually his history goes back to last year. It was in September twenty twenty when he came to our gastro medicine unit with complaints of abdominal pain and distension. All complaints were quite vague, and Even on palpation, there was no mass palpable. So investigations were done. A CT scan and an endoscopic biopsy helped arrive at the diagnosis of carcinoma stomach. 
and he didn't have much of pain, but whatever pain was there was managed with ultrasound three times daily. And through this, uh, through this admission, I think he contracted COVID and he turned COVID positive, but he was managed at his home for the next one month. So there was a delay for one month. And after October 2020, by around November, he developed malina, vomiting, and severe weight loss. He had been to the hospital in September when he weighed around 55 kilograms. And by November, he was weighing only 40 kilograms. And there was severe anemia, anemia also. So by then, he was taken to the medical college hospital at Trivandrum. And he was diagnosed to have gastric gist, gastrointestinal stromal tumor with a diagnostic laparoscopy. So this diagnostic laparoscopy was done and an inoperable mass was identified. There wasn't much, much they could do as per during the surgery. They treated him symptomatically with oral ultrasound and blood transfusion and a feeding jejunostomy tube was also done in light of the poor nutrition and inoperable mass and he was discharged in November 2020. Next slide please. So after a few days, he reported to our gastromedicine unit in December 2020. And then also the complaints were vague. So he was in the hospital for quite a long time. He came in with complaints of black stools, some vomiting, constipation, and generalized tiredness. The main reason why he was admitted in the hospital was to improve his general condition and to provide some amount of parental nutrition. It was only palliative. The admission purpose was palliative. But during the hospital stay, he developed massive hematemesis on December 4th. So initially, there was really supportive therapy being given, a little bit of blood transfusion was given, and some uh, vitamin K was given, but it could not be controlled. And in view of this continuing massive hematemesis, he was taken up for an exploratory laparotomy. And during the laparotomy, there was a large mass, and the surgery was actually exhaustive, a total gastrectomy, segmental colectomy, distal pancreatectomy, splenectomy, and the section of lateral metastasis was done. So the patient recovery was okay. The feeding jejunal tube stomy was used seven days post-operative. Next slide, Raju. So after 10 days, so by around after 10 days of his hospital stay, he started developing a bleeding through the abdominal drain. And his bleeding was actually initially of small amounts, but slowly and progressively increased. Therefore, a CT angiogram was done, which revealed a hemoperitoneum with a pseudoaneurysm of a left hepatic artery branch. So now there was a bleed and it had to be controlled. The patient was taken for a relaparotomy on the 6th, again, once again on the 7th. So there was actually a lot of surgeries for this patient. And his hospital stay was a long, protracted one. So he came in on the from 4th December to 26th January. So you see it's more than one month, two months almost he was in the hospital. And he was discharged in a clinically and symptomatically better and hemodynamically stable state. But I would say, as Dr. Rajagopal said in his first class, drained of all his finances after the one month of hospital stay. He presently reports to the oncology department for his chemotherapy, which is doxetaxel. And his last admission was a month back for parenteral nutritional therapy because he was very weak, he complained of generalized tiredness. Next slide, Ajay. So on examining him, he was conscious oriented. He was mobile and he was able to fulfill his personal requirements without help. He was not in much pain as his pain relief was full, but he was severely emaciated. His pulse rate remained at 70 per minute, was of constant nature and his BP of 120 80 mm. The abdomen was soft, non tender, while his feeding jejunal to his site appeared normal. Next slide. So, this time for his admission, we gave him only some supportive therapy, parental nutrition. So, investigations were done which revealed hyponatremia hypo, and hypoalbuminemia. So hyponatremia was not corrected aggressively, but hypoalbuminemia was attempted to be corrected with a one unit of human albumin transfusion because uh, the oral egg, nothing could be given to them. Empirical antibody therapy was also started as there was leukocytosis with neutrophilia. Hemoglobin was 9.5 gram 
percentage with an RBC count at 3.42 million cubic millimeter. Next slide, please. So the psychosocial aspect. So we here what we see is a man who has been in and out of the hospital from September 2020 to date. But how well was he before that? He was a manual laborer. COVID had also hit him well and he was not going to work much. And even now, he's not able to work at all because after the sickness has hit him, it's hit him hard. So it's from September 2020 that it has become difficult. He has not been working. His wife works at a local hospital as a nursing assistant. The son is qualified and he's working in this an office executive runs around uh, 15,000 per month. So that is okay. His daughter is still studying and he's a very caring and loving family. All three of his family members look after his needs very well. And I think that leaves him uh, very distressed mostly. Next slide, please. So the medications were to pro to scope in 100 ml of water per milk or milk four times daily. So Sri Devi Ma'am was telling us if you can drink only one spoon, if you can have only one spoon, why not be your favorite food? But here I think being if you're eating jejunos to me, this could be actually okay. So, so uh, vitamin D was given, Sinopacitol Nano 60K one unit, I international units once a week to have ultrasound semi three times daily and whenever he has constipation so that happens and he was given sort of loose 20 ml at night as soon as he was already on these drugs which is tabulating max 5 mg and tabsilaka 5 mg in that night so we can continue with those medications next slide please so what are his main concerns so actually when he comes to the hospital he seems to be okay because he can do all his routine things except for his feeling jejunous to me which he requires help with. but he's worried that he has become a burden to his family as his frequent hospitalizations have drained them financially his wife is unable to go to work regularly as he needs constant care but his wife is a trained nursing assistant i think that excellent care which she gives him is prolonging his life no, he's not very happy with the quality of the life. He's also worried that his frequent visits to the hospital might be a source of COVID infection for his children and might hurt them also. Next slide, please, Raju. So I started with a 56-year-old male. So through the last one year, he's 57-year-old male, known case of carcinoma stomach with metastasis, admitted for parental nutrition and supportive therapy. The last one year from diagnosis in September 2020 to the present date has been punctuated with hospital stay, surgery, COVID, and one episode of chemotherapy with Tocitaxel. Chemotherapy could not be continued much because of this tiredness and weaknesses. He has been in a persistent state of tiredness, but his supportive family wants to do as much as possible. Next slide, please. So, these are the points which I would want to discuss with Aggressive surgery done at the institution, which was gastrectomy, splenectomy, colectomy, distal pancreatectomy, and resection of liver metastasis. This has been life saving because it controlled his hematemesis and he's been living for the last five months. So, but did it improve the quality of his life? Or should we actually limit ourselves to giving symptomatic relief for the patient? To provide a better quality of life. Should advanced diagnosis be obtained from this patient? So if he has a bleed, do, do we, does he want a laparotomy done again and again? So these are the things which I would like this discussion to be focused on. Thank you. So thank you, um, Dr. Angela. Um, so just want to ask you a few points. Uh, as this patient, uh, do, uh, is he undergoing durative chemotherapy or palliative chemotherapy? The, the ostaxin was given as palliative chemotherapy initially, but actually even chemotherapy has been very unsuccessful because every time after a chemotherapy, we become sick. So we start, plan, started off in March, the March episode, then one week later he became very sick. April episode was also postponed because he was sick. Okay. So thank you. Um, so anybody want to 
will comment on um, any of these points. Uh, is the patient aware of his uh, metastasis, doctor? Yeah, he has been informed of the metastasis. He's aware of all the issues, uh, but his family is the one who wants to do as much as possible. He doesn't have much of a voice then because it's, you know, in our society, it's usually the family which decides once a patient becomes sick, we still haven't gotten to patient autonomy to the fullest. He's aware of his disease, but uh, any psychosocial aspects which have to be discussed, he has, nobody discusses that part with him. He's always given medical information. Should we discuss with the patient first that what does he want? Uh, because he's not happy with the quality of his life. So can we have a like counseling session with the patient? What does he desire? Uh, whether he wants to go for aggressive management or the surgical or he just wants to be pain-free and comfortable. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Anjata, uh, did we talk to him about uh, what is the quality of life uh, he's having? I didn't get you. No, uh, I am asking, did we talk to him about the quality of life he is having now? No, sir. No, sir. Nobody talks to him much about any of this. Like, uh, it's not a wholesome approach. What we have is okay. more like a medical approach. Yes, sir. Okay. So, Dr. Anisha, uh, he's an oncologist. I would like to speak. Anisha, you can speak. Okay, um, okay sir. Actually, this case finish is actually, uh, I think it is a slightly mismanaged case because there is no role for radical surgery in a stage 4 CA stomach because it is a metastatic situation. So the intention itself, initially itself is palliative. That's uh, it's sad actually this has happened to that patient because uh, we all know stomach is a bad prognostic malignancy. So if it is stage four, uh, if we uh, subject uh, such a um, higher, um, like a morbid surgery in such a patient, he will not have the quality of life or even a palliative chemotherapy. The, the, now the treatment is going on as palliative chemotherapy. I think which also the patient may not tolerate uh, further because his quality of life is very poor now. And um, uh, his uh, general condition uh, is not fit uh, from the history. I think it is not fit for even a, a chemotherapy like docetaxel. So this uh, should have been initially properly staged uh, with a PET CT or anything and should have initially started with palliative chemotherapy. Then we can uh, we should have given a good, um, good uh, quality of life to that patient, good symptom-free, because uh, he had a losses. Um, uh, this morbid surgery has bring down his health, his quality of life. And that is the main concept here, because once the stage four, what our intention is palliative treatment, then we have to decide how best to palliate, whether uh, using a palliative chemotherapy or there is no role for any radical surgery in a stage four case, especially in uh, malignancy. We can go for radical treatment initially, like um, if it is an oligometastatic. But this is this is not the case. This usually happens in many scenarios. Uh, it's so sad that it happened to a person. Um, next, uh, I think um, uh, even docetaxel is a, a toxic chemo regimen. It cannot be, uh, it is actually, he cannot even further, I don't think uh, he can tolerate it further because since he has a very poor health status, uh, maybe uh, symptom management uh, will be the only option, I think, left for him. Um, but uh, what would you do for that massive hematom if the patient is bleeding? So if you do... So uh, instead of that radical surgery, what could have been done? I mean, Actually, yeah, the main thing, if I would have seen this patient, I would have done a PET CT. We have to properly stage the patient. Uh, this is not an operable case in upfront setting. It's for sure. We will start with palliative chemotherapy. That is, uh, there are lots of regimens uh, based on his uh, health status. We can start. Definitely, uh, his symptoms will be improving because chemo will reduce, but we cannot cure the disease. We can um, we can make the patient symptom-free uh, without much, much compromising the quality of life. See, that's the main thing. Uh, yes. It's very important. Uh, the decision-making should be uh, taken. That is the concept of multidisciplinary tumor board management in malignancy because we have to discuss. It is not a decision taken by a surgeon or an oncologist or a, um, a radiation. It should be a tumor board discussion, whether it is upfront or operable. Everything should be done with the discussion with the radiologist and all. This is actually sadly a mismanaged case. And uh, probably if, if they had uh, uh, anticipated and started 
something palliative before maybe the bleeding would not have been so massive this yeah. emergency hematomesis and radical surgery could have been avoided like avoid that definitely yeah. yeah. but that was a quick decision no not a planned decision at all he came with massive hematomesis that was the history no uh, that we can yes ma'am the uh, ca stroke patient uh, they will have hematomesis that may be the only presenting symptom usually the other gastritic issues will be neglected usually by the people they will be treated with ppa and all so what happens is we admit the patient we treat for the hematomesis conservatively we, uh, we will do a proper staging after that proper staging we can analyze whether it is operable or because these type of surgeries we cannot do like a uh, without being planned because it is a very advanced surgery which is we should have been avoided that's what i think because considering this uh, that's what uh, it usually happens uh, that is the importance of multidisciplinary tumor board discussion in onco management it's very important actually Which, Sir, you know, i think dr audit has written something in the chat from the you want to Yes, so I, I agree. I think it's a question of how best to palliate, and it sounds as if his initial management was the sort of management you might do for a curative intent rather than a palliative intent. And it, um, and and I don't know. I, I my understanding is there's not much evidence for parental nutrition for patients who are cachectic from malignancy. I don't. I, um, I don't think that there's evidence for that, so I'm interested in people's comments on that as well. And and I don't think it's really a question of what the patient wants, really, or the family wants. I think it's, as Dr. Anish has been saying, I think it's good clinical medical decision making based on what we know about this disease mm -hmm. in a multidisciplinary. Yeah. Yes. you know management and I, and i i know in multidisciplinary cancer teams perhaps aren't available everywhere yes. in india as they're not necessarily available here either although definitely um it, you know it's it's the it's the i think option. major cancer centers all it is being implemented because this is the Uh, uh, it's very important because um, mismanagement initially itself it, it creates a lot of issues like quality of life will be compromised and like that yeah yeah and and you know it's not fair to ask a patient what they want in this setting because they they don't have the knowledge to that second radical surgery that was actually something like a life saving one no so at that point can we blame them the thing is they have to save the patient somehow they want they, nobody will want to lose a patient on table no so that is the scenario the the uh, that's what the concept the concept of onco because it is a mal okay, it is a malignancy okay. stage 4 so uh -huh. there is no point in reducing the quality of life with a morbid surgery because we cannot cure the patient that is the most important thing okay. if it was not an if it was a non malignant tumor or a, uh, it could have, we have saved the patient but this is a stage 4 tumor there is no role in local control that is the most important concept because this tumor has metastasis uh, so once we try to uh, do a very morbid surgery what happens is patient's quality of life will be compromised this is a very common scenario happening in many it, uh, lots of patients are coming to rcc like this mm -hmm. it's a very sad scenario i think i said it because everyone should be aware of it that's why many many cases it happens uh, it's very important actually that's why i clearly told the importance of um, uh, multidisciplinary management in the malignancy that uh, that change should uh, should be there no drastic change should be there like that that i think uh, that also brings us to the last point for about the advanced directive so if initially itself a tumor board has sat and decided and a counseling has been given to the patient telling them these are the complications that might arise in this case these are things that can be done what do you want to be done you know the sort of uh, guidance could have been I mean, should be given at least now. I think that should be done. Mm. That also okay. should be there. Otherwise, it is difficult to tackle. Sri Devi, do you want to come? Yeah. So now we were talking about what happened in the past, and I would like to talk what is to be done uh, from tomorrow morning onwards. I would like to make the. Uh, 
discussion with the patient and the family uh, uh, bring not bringing down the hopes but uh, make the hopes realistic that uh, what is what does he wants obviously everyone wants to live longer but yeah if that is not a possibility for how many days he is living what does he actually want and uh, definitely a separate conversation with the family uh, understanding what do they want if there are unrealistic hopes like uh, giving nutrition and making him more energetic as what it said there is no evidence for total parental nutrition and uh, the anorexia cachexia syndrome which he might be going through so that is one thing we can explain in simple terms how this is not going to help this patient and how this is going to be harmful no one wants to harm their loved ones so uh, and they all want to try so if you are trying is going to harm a particular uh, person so do you really want to try and uh, uh, trying is for ourselves not for the patient so these are the things which i might discuss with the family and uh, a, a discussion with the patient and the family bringing uh, in them into a realistic hope and definitely listing goals of care okay we have discussed everything give them proper time to think about it and come into a common understanding that what we can give we are not gods we can't just uh, uh, make him alive for a long time even if that is what he wants this is what i can give i can make you pain free i can help you if you vomit blood not by surgery but with the medications i have i may be able to control the vomiting uh, or i may be able to reassure your family uh, i may be able to be with you uh, when you're going through further distress in the future so these are the things which i can provide and these are the things which they want so coming to common platform which is realistically achievable and coming to goals of care would be one thing and that will uh, include the uh, I, i may not use advanced directives uh, per se but i would write it this is what he wants uh, this is what as a team including the patient and the family that is our goal of care for this particular patient so we know what to do uh, when it comes it will take time to uh, talk to the patient and the family and to uh, come into that common platform first we need to understand our limitations in uh, prolonging life Uh, so then once you understand what can be done then you start talking to them in simple language that they understand and give them time to think about it and uh, yeah and this is the best time before waiting for the next catastrophe it's, uh, it's good to have uh, good to have a discussion as early as possible and come into common terms otherwise what happens if he starts bleeding again then everyone would jump into that thinking a medical intervention and the patients and the family will also expect you to jump because they have uh, done so many things now again we are going to save the life which may not be possible so uh, these discussion uh, discussions should as uh, early as possible because he is alert and uh, the, uh, would be able to have a conversation at this point of time and his yeah, wife uh, wife is also a nurse so i think she may understand better so so yeah explain she may understand it actually i think it's a nursing assistant so uh, not not exactly a medical person might be so but yeah anyone it doesn't mean that they have to be uh, educated or uh, literate uh, uh, it depends on how we talk to them how we explain them the anorexia cachexia how we explain that uh, possibly he might have another episode of anorexia or possibly he might be dying so all these things depends on how we uh talk in their language and uh, uh, uh unofficially it's very difficult to make understand uh, medical professionals from our experience very very difficult to make them understand because they have some knowledge but it's not complete and they have a lot of stigma around uh, palliative care and such so uh, so uh a famous oncologist from india who is working abroad uh, dr sangam mitra who told that uh, poor die in peace and uh, the rich uh, die in misery uh, in icu uh, because they have money and uh, they want to do all this but the poor doesn't have money and uh, they want to die in peace so that's what uh, happens most of the time and this is especially to us they have been told that if there is a doctor in the uh, so i just uh, want to all you to all of you to think about the quality of life who will decide the quality of life are you going to decide the quality of life no i will decide my quality of life.
so the patient has to decide what is the quality of care so we have to ask him and uh, as uh, dr anisha told i uh, and the dr odin and uh, any others told good clinical uh, decision making is very important and in stage 4 uh, cancer uh, then uh, actually i think the, that was the time uh, during which we had to um, talk to him and to the family and make goals of care Uh, so uh, we would not have landed up uh, in this uh, difficult situation uh, so uh, probably this patient has a refractory ataxia which is indicated by his lean body mass and things like that so in refractory ataxia whatever be the nutrition you are going to give it is not going to improve it is it will not improve the muscle mass there is no evidence so i think Uh, as uh, say david told uh, it is important to have a family meeting and uh, discuss with them and um, find out the priorities of the patient how does he want to live the uh, remaining life uh, and uh, he has many worries including the covid infection to his children particularly this time so uh, it is very important to have a discussion with the family mm, now uh i think dr uh, nibun uh, has a comment dr nibun yes sir i am here yeah uh, you had a comment hello yeah can you hear us yes sir we had a Nibun, your voice is breaking. Nibun, your voice is breaking. We had a similar breaking. case in our institute. Yeah. We had a similar case in our institute. In our tumor board, we discussed uh, there was a person with metastasis with uh, CA colon, I think. And uh, the patient has gone, undergone multiple surgeries. but it prolonged the life expectancy of patient for about 2 to 3 years and uh, the surgeries were performed by gi surgeon and they were very much in favor strongly in favor actually of multiple surgeries and they said that it also improved the quality of life of the patient um our oncologist and uh, me as a palliative physician we were in favor that uh, the person already has mets so there there is no role of multiple surgery but they have presented some evidence to us uh, through some research papers which stated that this also improved the multiple surgeries improved the quality of life as well as expectancy of life in certain patients um hello oh uh, yeah uh actually uh, the first thing we have to think is whether it's an oligometastatic situation if there is a, a tumor has metastasized to a single site and if it is resectable we can cure the patient yes. that may be we were saying, saying that yeah but the, uh, uh, actually yeah. the same uh, thing they were saying if it has metastasized yeah. to a site just resect when yeah. it will we will have a look after uh, four months three months or six, uh, three months and if it has metastasized to some other site in 3 That's to 6 right. months we can go for repeated surgery yeah the actually the concept of oligometastatic works here because it is still a curable situation if that surge if that metastatic point is resectable it, we can still cure the patient but that decision should be taken with the discussion of the tumor board as well as we have to do a pet ct we have to rule out other meds should be also ruled out but this situation that was ca, CA colon isn't it now this is a ca stomach the prognosis of ca colon is uh, very good compared to ca stomach okay so uh, in a in the situation there is multiple metastasis so actually there is no role for a curative intent in this patient because it is a, it is an advanced malignancy with stage 4 with extensive meds only can only a role is palliative chemotherapy if we want to um, preserve this uh, his um, uh, quality of life that's what it happened because okay. after the global surgery he deteriorated okay 
I think you put a very valid point that we should differentiate in metastasis that whether it's oligometastasis yeah. or yeah. extensive yeah. metastasis. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. when we see the term metastasis, we think that it has metastasized to everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the that, same thing the VA yeah, surgeons yeah, told yeah, us yeah, that uh, yeah, if yeah. it is metastasis to a single site, we can resect it. And if yes. when we will see again after PET CT after six months, if it has metastasis to some other site, we will resect it. And they have uh, performed yeah, this yeah, patient. Yeah. Yes, so that that's that a very good thing. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, we have to wind up the discussion. Uh, even though we are not in a mind to stop the discussion. But uh, thank you all for a heated discussion uh, on this uh, patient management. And uh, this was very interactive. And uh, thank you, Audit, uh, for uh, being present with us. And uh, thank you, Sridhari, for that wonderful class. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Angela, for presenting a very good patient story, which was very thought-provoking. <laughs>